Hello, Jonathan and Jillian. Continuing our discussions of the rise of Islamic terrorism in the 1990s leading to the 9-11 attacks of September 11th, 2001. And we were talking about Al-Qaeda, how Al-Qaeda had been formed by Osama bin Laden uh, immediately following the victory of the Mujahideen in the war against the Soviets in Afghanistan. Uh, he had become enraged by the presence of American and other Western soldiers in the Holy Land of Saudi Arabia, the land of the Prophet Muhammad. And so he decided uh, that all of the West was the enemy of the Muslim people. And any Muslim government that associated or was on good terms with the United States was an enemy of him and his people. And he began to export this violent brand of Islamic fundamentalism overseas. One of the places where Muslim terrorists sprung up was actually the Philippines, the southernmost island of the Philippines, um, Mindanao, is uh, is a uh, majority Muslim uh, island, and there were separatists on Mindanao who wanted to break away from the rest of the Philippines because most Filipinos are Christians, most are Roman Catholics, but they wanted a an independent Mindanao for Muslims. And this call uh, of a fanatic uh, Islamic fundamentalist, Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, to take up arms against every government friendly to the West, which certainly included the Philippines, uh, resonated with some, only a minority, I'm sure, but uh, some people in Mindanao. And therefore, there grew up a, an indigenous version of Al-Qaeda in the Philippines, long away from the in the Middle East. Um, but one of the things that an Al-Qaeda branch in the Philippines, under Ramzi Yusuf's leadership, he was a bomb maker for Al-Qaeda, tried to blow up a plane uh, in December 1994. Uh, they put a bomb on the plane. It blew up and killed one Japanese businessman, but it didn't bring the plane down. It didn't do enough damage to the plane to bring it down. That had been a test run for a much bigger plan, uh, the Bojinka plan, that they had planned to put bombs on 12 airplanes, leaving the Philippines flying to the United States, a way to strike at both the Philippines and the United States to bomb these planes, which had probably mostly Filipinos, but some Americans on them, as the planes uh, for flying over their destinations in the U.S. Maybe they could hurt people on the ground in Los Angeles. Los Angeles or San Francisco, if they bombed 12 airliners after they got over the United States. So that was the Big Bang plan. Um, but Ramsey Yusuf, always a creative terrorist mastermind, was a little worried about his bombs not maybe working like they planned. After all, there was the failed attempt that killed one Japanese man. It was supposed to blow up an airplane and it failed. So he started thinking about alternatives, and it's actually him in January of 1995, it looks like, who introduced into Al-Qaeda the idea of using the planes themselves as weapons, hijacking a commercial airliner and using the plane as a kind of guided missile. Uh, you'd obviously have to get in the cockpit and be able to steer the plane, but to use the plane itself as a weapon was something that was floated as an idea more than six years before 9-11 attack within Al-Qaeda. Uh, but moving ahead, um, there was still a lot of violence yet to come. Um, as the United States began to focus on Osama bin Laden and his circle, uh, the FBI, when Ramzi Yusuf was captured, uh, realized that this was a, a major international organization. Uh, but I want to turn here. Uh, the U.S. convinced Sudan, uh, I'm sorry, Sudan in the Horn of Africa to expel uh, Osama bin Laden from the country where he'd been running a terrorist training camp um, in May of 96. And he will go back to Afghanistan where the Taliban fanatics who'd taken over uh, Afghanistan uh, gave him a welcome reception. 
Now, this right here, June 25th, 1996, was the first time Al-Qaeda struck the United States of America directly. And this was in Saudi Arabia. Ever since the Gulf War, we had kept some United States Air Force personnel in Saudi Arabia. And there were major American oil companies doing business there with lots of American employees. One large hotel that had U.S. Air Force personnel and American businessmen living in it was the Cobar Towers. 19 American military personnel and 500 others were injured when a truck bomb blew up at the Cobar Towers in Saudi Arabia in June 25th, 1996. This was the first time, it would not be the last time, that a truck bomb would be used to attack an American target or a, a target associated with Americans overseas. Um, I hope I already mentioned the 1993 uh, group of Al-Qaeda sympathizers who tried to blow up the World Trade Center building with a van full of explosives in the underground parking garage. That was back in 93. Here in 96, they actually pulled it off, killing a sizable number of Americans, injuring many, many more at Kobar Towers in Saudi Arabia. Um, you will see there at the bottom of the page, by May of 1997, we knew that there were Al-Qaeda operatives inside the United States. We just didn't know their identities or where exactly they were. But, you know, the, the Al-Qaeda wanted to be here. Um, all right. Um, it points out there by as, uh, in August of 97, we knew that there was a cell of Al-Qaeda in Nairobi, Kenya. That's going to be the cell that attacks us with a truck bomb at our embassy in, uh, in uh, uh, Kenya uh, a year later. Uh, February 23rd, 1998. This is uh, Osama bin Laden's famous declaration of war against the United States. He recorded on video and published it in their magazine. Yes, they had a glossy magazine, Al-Qaeda did. A declaration of war against the United States. It's chilling to watch. But he basically says to Americans, whoever we are, men, women, children, all Americans he considers legitimate targets in war because all of us, even children, support the illegal and illegitimate system of the United States, uh, as he sees it, and the abuse of Muslims. So he thinks it is not only okay, but a laudable, even holy thing to slaughter Americans everywhere for no other crime than being an American. It is very sobering to watch, but that is 1998, he tells the world that we are at war, that Al-Qaeda is at war with all Americans, wherever we may be on earth, that there is no place we can hide and there is no such thing in his mind as a civilian who can't be attacked. Uh, by the way, interestingly enough, John Miller of ABC News, an American reporter, uh, actually got a face-to-face -face interview in a mountaintop lair with bin Laden even after this declaration of war, he was indicted by, Bin Laden had been indicted by a federal court uh, for his role in um, uh, planning attacks on American defense establishments, um, Cobar Towers being one of those things. So uh, he was an, an indicted uh, criminal in the United States, but an American reporter actually had an interview with him. That's probably, that's the famous picture of him in a camouflage-looking uniform with an AK-47 behind him that I'm sure you've seen. Um, the FAA is very worried that there might be an Al-Qaeda plot to conduct, carry out hijackings. There you see, August 1998, they send out a circular to airlines in the United States saying, watch out for Islamic terrorists hijacking. Um, but there is the, the major blow against us uh, in the late 90s. August 7th, 1998, truck bombs went off outside the American embassy in Nairobi, Kenya, and the American embassy in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Both of those are in Eastern Africa. Now, these bombs were, were devastating. You see the Kenya bomb killed 213 and injured 4,500. The Tanzania bomb killed 11 and injured 85. 
The overwhelming majority of people who were killed and injured were actually Kenyans and Tanzanians. There were Americans killed and injured in both places. But remember, our embassies overseas mostly are staffed by people who live in that country. Uh, our diplomats are the sort of the top layer of people who work in the embassy. They, but they have uh, probably three or four native people working under them for each American. So it makes perfect sense that most of the people killed and injured are going to be people from that country who work there or were simply coming hoping to get a visa so they could come and visit the United States or had some other business with the American embassy. That's very common. Uh, so this really was a blow, not just at the United States, but at any country, anybody, anywhere, who was friendly to the United States. We were all targets, not just Americans, but people who don't hate us were, were targets in Al-Qaeda's mind. Um, the mention here on August 20th, 1998, we knew who'd done it. We knew it was Al-Qaeda that bombed our embassies. And we knew that there were still camps in Sudan and businesses that Al that uh, bin Laden owned in Sudan. So Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton, ordered a Tomahawk missile strike against them. Um, little serious damage was done, but it was seen as a symbol of an attack on Al-Qaeda, but not much accomplished by that. Um, okay. Okay. This uh, note down here, September 1998, realizing that some of the same people who had been involved in the 1993 truck bomb attack on the parking garage of the World Trade Center had also been involved in planning the attacks on uh, Tanzania and Kenya, our embassies in those countries. All right, moving ahead. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, 1999, uh, visits Germany. We now know that they had planned to use Germany as a kind of launching pad for attacks against the West. Germany uh, is a Western country, but it has a lot of students from the Middle East who go to their universities. And several of the pilot hijackers on 9-11 had actually studied in Germany. Uh, and so there, was a, there were cells of Al-Qaeda operating under the authorities' nose in Germany. And Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was basically the leading strategic planner for Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. All right, moving ahead. I'm not going to go through all these meetings of Al-Qaeda, but now we're getting close. January 3rd, the year 2000. This was an attempt in Yemen, which is just south of Saudi Arabia, an attempt by Al-Qaeda operatives to bomb an American ship, the USS Sullivan, as it sat in the harbor of Aden, Yemen. They loaded a, a fast little speedboat with bombs and had meant to f go right alongside the American ship and blow it up in hopes of singing it, sinking it. Uh, the terrorists, though, put too many bombs on the boat and it sank before it could get to our ship. So that was a failure. Unfortunately, um, this unfortunate business is that um, uh, they, they learned a lesson from this. And you will see that, where is it? Ah, there you go, October 12th, 2000. So a few months later, a successful bombing, just like the one that had been planned against the Sullivan, was carried against the USS Cole. Uh, the, sh the boat came roaring up alongside the American ship and blew up and blew a hole in the side of the ship, killing 17 U.S. sailors who were asleep in their bunks. Um, it nearly sank the ship. It almost sank it, but not quite. And so the, the toll of it, dead and injured could have been much greater. Uh, but the Yemeni authorities quickly figure out it was Al-Qaeda. So when they attacked us on 9-11, as soon as I heard about the attacks, I was pretty certain it was Al-Qaeda because I, you know, I followed the news and I knew that the cold attack had been Al-Qaeda. I knew that the Kenya and Tanzania embassy attacks had been Al-Qaeda. I had seen the footage of him declaring war against all Americans everywhere. So 
as soon as those planes hit the, the Twin Towers and the Pentagon on 9-11, I said, I'll bet that's Al-Qaeda. And the, our leaders knew immediately that it was Al-Qaeda, too. I wasn't being a genius or anything. Um, all right. Uh, going back, though, see this? Al-Hamzi -Ham, Al and Al-Midhar enter the U.S. These were the pilot hijackers. And you see down there, investigates a flying school. The plan was to send Al-Qaeda terrorists into the United States, men who didn't have a record, who wouldn't be red flagged. And remember, although we had been attacked by Al-Qaeda, America just wasn't at war footing against terrorism at the time. You could still come and go from the United States very, very easily in the year 2000, before the 9-11 attacks. Uh, and th these flight schools had a lot of students from overseas coming to get training so they could become commercial pilots. So it wasn't odd to have these men from Saudi Arabia coming to be trained to get a commercial pilot's license. What was odd is a flight school in Minnesota realized they had a student from Saudi Arabia who was pretty eager to learn how to fly a plane once it was in the air, but he had no interest in learning how to take it off or land it. Now, if you know anything about flying a plane, you realize those are the two parts of the flight that are the most important. <laughs> you really need to know what you're doing when you take a plane off, and you really need to know what you're doing when you land it. Flying a commercial jetliner in the air is not that big a deal, but that's all this, pilot, this student pilot cared to learn about. So much so did this bother his flight instructors, they turned his name into the FBI. The FBI did a check and realized he had lied on his visa application to study in the United States, so they locked him up. So he wasn't locked up for being a terrorist. He was locked up for cheating on his visa application. But when the attacks happened, he was actually in jail. So he would have been another pilot hijacker, but they had to go with a backup pilot on one of the planes uh, because of his getting caught. Anyway, that's as long as I could possibly go in this video. So I'll stop here and tomorrow we'll finish and get to 9-11. God bless.